we've got a uh, pear here. This is a Russian pear. And then we've got right next to it a birch. You know, so why am I planting a birch tree in and around my food forest crops? The hope is that any deer coming from other people's lands into mine are going to hit this first. And it's north of the tree that I'm trying to companion plant with it. And the deer will eat this. Uh, healthy leaves and the the wood they really like it as well so the goal is that they eat that and they leave my birch alone Hey everybody, you want to go outside, but you're going to be cold in like two seconds. <laughs> you want to go outside too? Oh my gosh. Hey. You know, this time of year, I'm always looking for somewhere with nicer weather to maybe start a homestead. But to be honest, something about Canada that I just absolutely love. You know, the snow in wintertime is freezing, but it's beautiful. I mean, just look at it here. It's also nice to kind of get a bit of a break. It's nice to kind of just kick your feet up and get everything settled out in the fall time and then start planning, use the winter time as planning and shopping and you know, early, early spring, late winter, do that for like building infrastructure projects. So it's, you know, building swales and stuff like that. And every single time of the year in January, February, after some, you know, nature dumps a foot or two of snow on us and we gotta dig it out while going to work and, you know, managing the rest of day-to-day -day life, kids hockey, it's uh, it's a lot, but it's it's actually really, really nice. So I think maybe today we'll just kind of do a little easy going video and show you some of the stuff that I do in the winter time on the weekends. And uh, we'll check out the chickens and maybe do a little bit of a walk around the property. Who knows what we'll see. But uh, we've got a lot of snow lately, so it's a good opportunity to get out there on our land and see where nature is using it. Might be able to see some deer tracks and they might be concentrating in one area or another. And that might tell me where I need to put up additional thorny bushes to try to keep them out. On the deer side of those thorny bushes, maybe where I want to try to plant some more, you know, wild apples and, you know, do some grafting, that kind of thing. Um, maybe planting some willow, uh, birch, things that deer actually don't mind eating. They like eating young sumac, so maybe think about putting a sumac coppice down in there somewhere and 
so that they're eating the regenerative shoots all the time. So we'll see. Let's go take a look. Right. Come on, Harry. Cold, buddy. Hi, Harry. Come on, dude. Nope. Alright, let's do a little walk. You coming? You wanna come? Check out the pond. So here's the pond right now. Really peaceful out here. Let's go check out some of the food forest. Maybe we'll just pop over here and take a look at the chickens. So you can see I got a net up here for the dogs to not go on the pond. They're pretty good now. So we'll fix this. And what do we do for the pond over the winter time is pretty much just this here just run an aerator pump we do it on the top surface you actually don't want to do it too deep you want to actually bring those up in the winter time the fish apparently don't like it when it's right on the bottom so we bring those up and actually it keeps the pond from freezing over completely sometimes when it gets really cold like minus 40 it'll actually freeze all up around but there'll be this little cavern so it'll be kind of flat and then they'll just be like this dome like a cave of ice and a little bit of gas will get out and that's all you need to do is just get that gas exchange going so that the co2 from the fish can actually get out and oxygen can get back in so you just need that gas exchange going on so we just fed the chickens this morning and the snow is up to my knees like they're all hiding inside these uh leaf bags on the bottom there function really well for keeping the heat in i noticed all throughout the day that they head underneath there get out of the wind when it's really windy right now i think they're probably all huddled up inside uh, we've left the food and the water out so far and i've just come in and shoveled any snow that blows in and then I'll give the bedding a turn. It's pretty deep in there with the amount of uh, you know food scraps I've given and then all the leaf bags that I put in there. So it's pretty easy to turn even when it's cold. And I'll just flip that over. And then they peck at some stuff and keeps the snow off of the ground in the run. And then they actually come out to the food and the water. But uh, we have had the odd really cold day. Come out and check on them and make sure they're all right. I don't usually open this door here, but just so you guys can see they're just all hanging out hey. oh, come on so all we do in the winter time is just continuously add more leaves and you can see we've got lots of leaves down in there and that just keeps uh, their feet nice and clean from stepping on you know poop and then in the summertime we'll rake all that out and just continue composting it. Hi. They usually come on out when I come out because I give them food, so they know that they know that maybe in here's treats. <laughs> I got nothing. Sorry. Hi. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> Try 
trying to eat the thumbnail bruise off my finger. <laughs> yeah, that's not very yummy. I think one of my favorite things is how chickens drink. So winter time we open up these uh, vents at the top just enough to get some air exchange going on in the coop, get some ventilation for them. But uh, with the compost actually inside, it's actually quite warm. Hi. Yeah, with uh, like I can feel uh, at least 10 degree difference. It's actually quite warm in here so even though it's about minus 12 outside right now celsius it's uh it's quite warm in here believe it or not so what we can do is take a quick walk down to the bottom i don't think i've ever come down this way and i might not now i'll see how slippery it is this is around the back side of the pond so there's the pond there and you can see that the snow's pretty deep. And then jammy pants, yeah. All the best, all the hardest, best work is done in jammy pants. Ooh, it is deep. <laughs> yeah, like, that's my knee. Up to my knees here. But I like that it lets me see what's going on down here this is an area here where we have cedars and just on the outside of the cedars we have some uh, some wild apples that I graft so often I'll see a lot of deer traffic down in here you can see there's deer those are deer prints so they come down here so they come down here to uh, to nibble on some late season apples some of the trees had apples even last week um, I don't see any now I don't see any right now let's head through here basically what I would do yeah, yeah no apples left but what I would do is on my drive into work, I would uh, keep my eyes open for for any kind of uh, apple trees that still had their fruit in really, really cold weather. And then I'd take scion wood from that. And then I would, so it's just basically cuttings. About, uh, same as a old, uh, an old wooden pencil, you know, those kind of thick wooden pencils that some of us older people would have had maybe back in like kindergarten, grade one, grade two. So you do cuttings like that, and then you just graft them onto these wild trees at your deer entry locations. We had a uh, an old barbed wire fence that I took down in this uh, edge of the forest here. Sorry for the noise of the snowplow there. There's a court just on the other side of these trees, maybe about 300 feet. That yeah, snowplow is going. So we would have uh, deer come in. As soon as I took that barbed wire fence, deer started coming in. To our property i didn't want the barbed wire fence because at the time we had small kids that were playing um to be honest i don't know if i would like the barbs on the barbed wire fence i don't really 
like the idea of an animal getting hurt, but uh, the fence was handy in keeping things out. Now it comes, more wildlife comes in. So you can see these, uh, it's been snowing all night. So these are some older tracks down here. Um, some of these are mine. You can tell the bigger tracks. Those are mine from doing some previous observations down in here. This is the stream that runs at the border of my land. So we own about six feet on the other side of that stream. This stream is fed from agricultural land up north of us, up above us, and we've gotten the water test. And it's just absolutely full of Roundup and all sorts of chemicals from industrial ag. So we don't use that water anymore. It's too bad because some of the larger streams were um, cities, just quickly, this is an old composting bay that I that I used to run. Now we do it a little closer to the house. But some of the bigger streams and tributaries get water sampled and probably farmers that feed into those are a little more responsible. Some of these smaller streams, they don't really get sampled and tested very often and you see the worst parts of human agriculture and runoff coming into them. And it's too bad because I've, I had plans of taking that water and running it up, like siphoning off just a little bit, running it off into the top of my land and building a little pond there. So I have high water, high in the land. And then it would just overflow and eventually trickle its way back into, back into there. But uh, I guess environmental laws, you can't tap into any kind of existing waterway, which those rules are there for good reason. Um, but I wouldn't want to even do it now anyways, um, just because of what's in that water. These corkscrew willows are really good wildlife food. It's another reason I have them down here, and they're really cool. I mean, they're super interesting. Not good for firewood and anything like that, but, you know, really nice, neat old trees. You can make really nice art projects, too, with the cuttings from this. And because they're willow, if you just cut this, off maybe something more like that cut that off and jam this whole branch maybe trim it a bit make it about a foot oh, sorry make it about a foot two feet and then jam that a foot into the soil maybe even uh, 16 inches into the soil you'll get a new willow tree They're one of the easiest plants to propagate like that so we've planted another one there this is a willow and you'll notice it's kind of you know, central to some of the pawpaws because this wild area pawpaw that I planted out gets uh, a lot of deer browse. And I figure if I can feed them something they like better, which is that uh, willow there, then they'll leave the pawpaws alone and it's been tremendously successful. And then you can see I've also added tons of raspberries, hazelnuts, elderberries, wild cherry, elder did i say elderberry elderberry currants down in here in this lower area and that way there's just tons of food for wildlife down here and i can get some of these pawpaws and then i'll turn this area here into kind of more of a wild forage um, opportunistic grazing for me and wildlife food for wildlife this here is a uh, blackthorn but it's actually a it's a prunus species and uh, it makes a little fruit. It's thorny and it can be highly invasive. It's quite invasive here. So I've been kind of deciding whether I'd cut it down or not. But one thing that you can do is actually cut it off. And then when the shoots come up, you can actually graft other prunus species onto the, this tree. So, you know, you can graft um, plums, I believe, onto blackthorn. So we might try that in the future. Because it's down in this lower area, and I have so many projects on the go, we haven't got around to that yet. But uh, something that we might think about doing in the future, turning an invasive plant that really wants to grow, great rootstock, turn that into a uh, food crop that we want to eat. I think that's a good example of uh, using the problem as the solution. And that's kind of what we really try to get to, not just in permaculture. You know, permaculture has kind of tried to take that term, but the idea is basically pervasive in all engineering science. 
try to turn a problem into a solution, try to maximize efficiency. These are all core engineering terms. This right here is my uh, sumac coppice area. So we get a lot of our biochar feedstock from there. Probably come in and do a cut again sometime February, maybe March. And we'll cut out about a quarter of these and we'll cut out a quarter of them every single year. That way they're always regrowing and you got a constant stock of uh, free biomass for charcoal. The charcoal then gets put into our compost to inoculate and charge up with nutrients and soil microbiology. And then that gets put into the food forest systems and gardens where that carbon then gets locked up and stored for roughly 2000 years. It's one of the most stable forms of carbon in our soil like the terra preta soils of the Amazon and uh, become nutrient and uh, microbiology soaks and that's really important especially in cold climates where we've got giant snow melts all at once you want to soak up that water when it comes available in the spring and all that nutrient we don't want it running off our land we want to capture it and store it and hold it so that's why, you know, I'm really pushing for a lot of biochar here. This here is a swale that I put in. So this is a, I believe this is a bark nut tree here. We've got some sumac and we've got a pawpaw and a bunch of um, sea buckthorn all in around here. And an apple down there. We've got some elderberries and currants on this swale. And basically just cut a trench out, put all the downhill soil on this side and that way any of this snow melt from right across my whole property comes down and runs it'll hit this swale and this swale runs from all the way here all the way down there right to the edge and that way we hold any of this nutrient that wants to run away and you can see this bark nut here is probably three years old and it's just a giant it's just a beast and those things will grow fast but when you capture and store all that water and hold it in organic matter in the soil, oh, that thing, you know, it'll just go crazy. We've got a small little micro pond here that we dug just on the south side of this apple. And because it's on the south side of these apples, I've been putting some zone pushing plants on the north side of this so that we've got the reflection from the sun coming in, warming up the area all around it. We've got the thermal mass to the south and the sun hitting the water and warming it up as well. So this area here will actually warm up very quickly in the spring. And So just in editing here, I want to expand on this a second. Um, I say here that it'll warm up faster in the spring. It's not quite true. It'll, it'll actually warm up the low faster, but the, the high will actually be slightly cooler because it's a moderated uh, temperature. So instead of having a big swing from really cold at night to really hot in the day, it'll actually be more balanced. This is a way that you can get some um, late or mid-season apples, for example, planted here, and they'll bloom a little earlier, and then they'll cross-pollinate with some of our medium uh, season apples that are a little further down. So that way I can get a little bit of variety difference, but at the same time I get that cross-pollination going. And it's all just using physics and thermal mass. So you can see up here we've grafted some late season apple tree uh, holding apples and they're still on. So, you know, when I said that we had apples down in that lower area, I wasn't joking. We do have apples from the grafts that we've done. And then this good thing about this is that the animals that are coming in here looking for food, you know, they're just trying to survive. So they come in here in the food forest and our gardens looking for food, but if they can't find it, they eat our trees. So that's when you start seeing damage and they eat all the trees. But if we can find ways to feed them, even if it gets them a little drunk, then uh, they can find sustenance and nutrition and maybe not eat our trees. You know, we'll still see some damage and anytime that you grow and live with nature, you're going to see losses to nature. And that lower area being devoid of any apples left on the trees really goes to show you that uh, wildlife are actually enjoying those apples because it's actually the same genetics that I use to graft this tree. And they've cleared those trees out completely. 
a lot of the questions that I get on this channel are, you know, how can I prevent Axe Pass from doing any damage to my system? And the answer is basically conventional agriculture, spraying, trapping, killing, and claiming nature for ourselves. That's the answer to that question, unfortunately. And I think everyone here is, be is here because uh, we want a different way of doing things. Part of that is that we have to accept some loss to nature, and that's okay. So my peaches, for example, sometimes they'll have a bug in them. My pears, sometimes they'll have a coddling moth in them. And I just cut that out, I eat around it. And to be honest, since I've had this methodology of allowing that to happen, allowing these pests to exist on my property, we see the predators come in. And the predators now have food, and they establish themselves on my land. I'm walking right in my swale now. And the predators establish themselves in my land. And because of that, even though we do see some losses like that because of our philosophy, it's 1% maybe somewhere between one and three percent like not much higher than three percent that we lose and i think that that's a fair price to grow food in systems that live and work with nature you know, so for example we're right in the middle of my food forest here get down in this swale here we've got a uh, pear here this is a russian pear and then we've got right next to it a birch you know so why am i planting a birch tree in and around my food forest crops because they'll end up shading it out well this birch is on the north side of that tree and it's not really shading anything out on the um, that's north of it and um, the birch is great food for deer so the hope is that any deer coming from other people's lands into mine are going to hit this first and it's north of the tree that I'm trying to companion plant with it. And the deer will eat this. And uh, birch has really good uh, healthy leaves. And the, the wood, they really like it as well. So the goal is that they eat that and they leave my birch alone. And here is another um, blackthorn here. So there's another blackthorn tree. Again, the idea is to give some trees to nature and uh, not necessarily only plant stuff that's for us i can kind of do that i have a decent bit of land here we're on four acres and i've got about two acres planted so i can kind of do that a little bit sacrifice some of my space but you'll find most typical orchard plantings do have the room for that you know if you take out the odd tree for a nitrogen fixer uh, especially a nitrogen fixer that provides a different type of yield, you know, a wood yield or um, a yield for nature, then you can you know, create more functionality in your system. It doesn't have to just be apple trees. You get more resilience like that. You know, maybe take out a quarter of the apple trees and put in a quarter of diversity. Some stuff for nature, some stuff for support species, and overall your yield probably goes up, you know? Like it probably does. Your yield goes up because you get less pest pressure. You get better pollination maybe. You get less browse from deer and rabbits. If you are planting things that they like instead. So give that a try. Plant with nature. Well, thanks for watching everybody. I hope uh, this was a bit more of a lighthearted, fun gardening channel uh, video. And I hope you guys like that. Uh, some of the more serious topics that we do in the wintertime, it's just because, you know, first off, probably I read more news uh, in the wintertime, so I get exposed to more of that negativity. I think it's important to read and understand what's going on in the world, though. So, you know, one way out is to basically just unplug yourself from all that. I don't fault anyone for doing that. I think overall it's probably better for your, your health and sanity and just focus on what you can do. You know, I, I talk all the time about your sphere of influence and your sphere of control and to spend your um, actual energy and attention into those things. You know, I can't do a whole lot about, um, you know, capitalism gone off the rails, uh, greed, that kind of thing from, you know, CEOs and megacorps. 
um, you know, but I can do more than I used to, which is I can make videos to, you know, bring that to the public. Um, I think if I didn't have this YouTube channel, I probably would spend less time talking about, thinking about that kind of thing and more time thinking and talking about my, my gardens, my fruit trees and how I'm going to turn this land, uh, into a nature sanctuary. So thanks for watching everybody. Hope you enjoyed this lighthearted video and I'll see you guys on the next one.